I would like to welcome you all to the GIS tools, templates, and free resources for COVID-19 webinar. My name is Kevin Mickey. I am the president-elect of the Urban and Regional Information Systems Association, as well as the director of professional development and geospatial technologies education at the Polis Center, which is an applied research center at IUPUI. Your and its members have a long history of supporting the GIS community and those that it serves. The COVID-19 pandemic is yet another example of that service is demonstrated by the work of our GIS core volunteers, as well as the many others who are actively developing and contributing information that can mitigate the impacts of this ongoing crisis. This webinar is being offered under conditions that I'm sure we could all say were unimaginable only a few short weeks ago. As geospatial professionals, we have an obligation to support our communities over the coming months as they respond to and overcome the struggles that lie ahead. The webinar is going to provide us all with critical information that can be used towards that end. I'm honored to now introduce you to a friend and colleague, Mr. Brent Jones, who is ESRI's Global Manager of Cadastral and Land Records. Brent will introduce today's presenters. All right, thanks a lot, Kevin. Uh, we're happy all of you could take the time to join us today for this uh, this very important webinar. Um, we will have some follow-up meetups uh, that will show that will dig into the technology on this and be a bit more interactive uh, and hands-on if you're interested. I'll paste uh, how to get involved in that in the window. And we also so in the background here we have Kevin Ruggiero who will be answering technical questions if you have some. Uh, but I am pleased to introduce Esty Garrity, who's our chief medical officer here at Esri. Uh, with an extensive background in, in using the technology to, to diagnose and uh, attack and understand and convey information about problems uh, such as this pandemic we're in right now. And many of you may know Richard Ledbeater. He's a, a senior manager on our state and local government solutions team, heavily involved in state government, heavily involved in elections. And he's going to show us um, some some pretty cool stuff on policy maps that will uh, uh, hopefully generate some ideas and uh, help you guys uh, do your work better. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Esty. Thanks, Brent. Uh, I appreciate it. Hello, everybody. And um, just want to say I'm, I'm really pleased to have been invited here to share this information at such a critical time in all of our lives. Um, coronavirus or COVID-19 is, as you well know, creating massive public health challenges for communities across the globe, including, of course, and, and prominently now in the United States. And I think that everyone is looking for tools and opportunities to be able to make informed decisions and deliver services as quickly as possible, uh, given the needs that we have all around us. But we know that it can be a real challenge to coordinate data resources and maps and information products across all of the relevant departments in government, uh, not to mention the need to share information with the public. And I would say while the pandemic has a global impact, we all kind of understand that it's often the responsibility of the local communities to do the majority of the response and to share information that's relevant to their own region. And each community is of course unique. And we know that the most appropriate mitigation strategies are gonna vary based on what is going on in that jurisdiction with regard to the transmission of the virus, the community and the population characteristics and that area's overall capacity to respond. You need tools that will help you to get the lay of the land in an area to make good decisions and take action. Now, as a way to support all of you and the work that you do, uh, at Esri, we deployed our own ArcGIS Hub uh, product to serve as a one-stop shop for tools, data, and services that are related to COVID-19. So I hope that you've already seen this resource, but if not, take a screenshot or capture the URL, pretty easy to remember, coronavirus-resources.esri.com. 
Uh, everything that I'm going to talk to you about today is right here in the COVID-19 GIS Hub. So I thought I'd start with giving you a brief tour of some of the contents of the Hub. And uh, first of all, you come to this screen. Um, you should know that we're updating the materials in this site every day. So to make it easier for you, uh, so you can see what's new, you can always go to the top and we have this black banner that shows what is the new thing released on that day. So check back often and see what's new there. Second, we are highlighting the fact that you can request GIS assistance when you need it. And I'm gonna provide a little bit more detail about that later. Now, the first thing that you're gonna see when you scroll down in the hub is some of the big dashboards. You'll see the World Health Organization dashboard. Um, and I will say that that should be considered the authoritative data for countries around the world. And people are asking me all the time, why does the WHO dashboard look different from the Johns Hopkins University dashboard? Um, there's a few reasons, but first of all, I will say that WHO is reporting confirmed cases, um, while the Johns Hopkins University dashboard, the one you're seeing on the right, uh, is also an authoritative resource because I think they have a sound methodology. They're doing great work, um, but they are looking at not only confirmed cases, but also presumptive cases. So that's one reason why their dashboard is always showing a little bit higher numbers. And I think it's worth knowing that Johns Hopkins for a long time was not providing county level data. And for the last week or so, uh, that's back and freely available for everyone to use and pull into your own uh, local dashboards. Um, and also note that these two dashboards are updated at different schedules, so you could also see some differences there. But besides these two examples, uh, the GIS Hub has literally hundreds of other different dashboards and applications that you can look at and use uh, for inspiration and ideas from around the world. Now you should also, I think, check out this brand new application, which uh, at least for the United States is organizing the different US dashboards and applications as a system of systems approach. So in the white map, you can select a state and you can see the different tools that were created by the state or its counties. Like I'm from California and I know this, the type is small, but I can see that there are five different uh, apps or dashboards in California that I could explore. Now on the green map to the right, that's a little bit different. You can actually create some infographic reports there, uh, like this one from the state of Kansas, that would give you important population characteristics to consider when you're thinking about COVID-19 and its impacts. Now next, as you explore the hub, you're going to see that it's organized across three broad areas getting started, getting data, and getting updates. In the getting started section, you'll see the five steps that we're recommending that responders use to begin to understand COVID-19 and its impacts. So those five steps are mapping the cases, mapping the spread, looking at vulnerable populations, understanding your capacity and ability to surge, and communicating with maps. And I'll be spending some of my time today covering these steps and how to operationalize them with the GIS tools and resources that we're providing during the pandemic. In the Get Data section, you're going to find some featured data sets like school closure information, hospital bed information, the current COVID-19 data at the county level, the CDC's social vulnerability index, and even some data sets to help measure the success of shelter at home uh, recommendations like the UNICAST data that provides social distancing grades. It's a really interesting data set. Uh, you should take a look. Now, if you go to the bottom of the Get Data section, you're going to see uh, an opportunity to view more data sets. And there you're going to find demographic data, population density, chronic disease information, facility information, healthcare provider data, real-time traffic data, and much more. So lots and lots of data for you to use. 
Now, the section for getting updates provides both professional and public level information from our most authoritative agencies, the World Health Organization, the United States CDC, and the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I also want to bring your attention to the resources page uh, that you can access from the top right corner. Here is where you're going to be able to get the tools that you'll need. Um, for example, you can launch uh, either or both of our solution sets. One is for business continuity and one is for community response. And I'm going to go through those in more detail in a little bit. Next under resources is our guidance section. And here there are blogs and tools that are going to help you to follow best practices, whether that's mapping coronavirus responsibly or protecting health information. And I did want to just take a moment to say a brief word about protecting health information. Uh, as I'm sure you know, health data is sensitive and we have to be careful about how we deal with it and how we share information. And all of the facts about this are covered under the law known as HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Now that said, I don't want you to use uh, HIPAA as a barrier to doing good work in, in your uh, job responsibility area. We have lots of resources that can help guide you in the proper use and de-identification of geographically based health data including uh, I'm showing you this offer that comes from our business partner, GIS Inc. Now they built a really cool tool called MapMask. It's used as an extension to ArcGIS Pro that helps you to perform things like geomasking and other methods of data obfuscation so that you can work with the more local data than a county and still have good privacy protections in place. So take a look at that. Now we've also put together a number of how-to resources that will help you do the specific work that you may need to do during this pandemic. There are blogs and videos and short tutorial style lessons, uh, lots of different things in this area. We're all working to keep ourselves, our community, our nation and our world healthy and lots of people want to help. Uh, it's no surprise that uh, the GIS core, the ERISA GIS core, is where we are directing people who have GIS skills and want to help out in this crisis. Um, so it's a great uh, opportunity to uh, take those additional resources and do more good in the world. We've also set up a special GeoNet site to host more technical conversations when you have questions, um, and you just want to be a part of that technical community. Now, finally, when things start to calm down a little and we get to the point of, say, debriefings and after action reports and examining our lessons learned through this crisis, that's when I think you're probably going to want to take a close look at uh, some more long-term resources to help you get set up with GIS in bluer skies if you're not already to prepare for the next emergency, whether that's a fire, a hurricane, or another public health crisis. So uh, with that overview of the hub site, let me start getting a little more specific. I want to dig into those five steps that I mentioned before. So they're going to offer a real evidence-based way for you to make decisions as we go through this uh, crisis together. So step one is to map the cases. Now I'm talking primarily about um, several levels of cases, right? The confirmed cases, the active cases, the fatalities and the recovered cases to get that overview that you're gonna need to understand the current situation. So I've been asked the question many times, uh, where do you get the data? And ideally I wanna say that you may have case level data in your organizations if maybe you're working for County Public Health, for example, that may have detailed address data and other information uh, that would be more ideal for your own internal analysis and review. But failing that, I would recommend getting the same detailed level of data from the state's NEDS system. And uh, that's the National Electronic Disease Surveillance System if you have that up and running well. 
Every state is supposed to have one of these, and it was created for this whole idea of public health surveillance and reporting. But again, I will say that if neither of those options work for you for whatever reason, then the Johns Hopkins University county level data is available on our hub site for you to use and embed in any maps and information products that you create. So no matter what data source you use, I did want to uh, take a moment to remind you that you should always properly attribute uh, your data resources and create good metadata. Some people have gotten caught for that. Okay, so here is an example of Fauquier County, Virginia's COVID-19 case dashboard. And they've actually pulled in all of the cases for the state to give context. Um, but when you zoom in, then you can see what's actually going on in Fauquier County itself. And at the point that I took this screenshot, there are nearby cases to the east that I'm guessing the authorities are watching quite closely. So we could talk about step two, which is mapping the spread of the disease. Now, epidemiologists actually like to look at the number of cases per day so you can start to see an outbreaks distribution over time, like this example that I pulled from the World Health Organization dashboard. Now, what I'm suggesting when I say map the spread um, takes this idea of the epidemiologic curve to the next level and adds a geographic spread as well. Uh, we could maybe call it a spatial epi curve, if you will. Um, when you know the direction of spread and the pace of disease spread, you can start to really think about things like when and where you should target interventions like shelter in place instructions. So I want to show you an example of a spatial epi curve that comes from the University of Virginia's Biocomplexity Institute. And so I've got this little video running and across the top you can see a day-to-day -day time slider which shows the number of new cases per day um, which is also expressed in that graphic on the left and the mapped uh, cases in, in the map area. So a really kind of nifty way to do this. It's one of the best examples I've seen. So as we move on and think about step three, uh, that's about mapping vulnerable or higher risk populations. Now, some, some people are gonna be at higher risk of getting severe disease with COVID-19, um, like older adults, those who have chronic medical problems, uh, some may be at higher risk for actually transmitting disease, like people who live in high density populations. Uh, people can have vulnerabilities in terms of their socioeconomic status, like people who are experiencing homelessness or who lack health insurance. So all of these factors are distributed differently across our communities. And it can be especially helpful to create an index of vulnerabilities for your own communities uh, relevant to this disease and use that information to then better protect those uh, populations at risk. Now, I have some examples for step three in Kansas City, Missouri, using the Esri Hub data and the Policy Maps Viewer. And Richard's gonna talk a bit more about Policy Maps Viewer, so I'll go through this quickly. Uh, this first map is just showing where we have high numbers and high percentages of seniors across the community. And then we'll shift over to looking at population density, where the lighter colors are higher density and thus more likely to have interactions among the residents. Now the CDC in the US has made their social vulnerability index data available so that we could look at this index, which gives you 15 different measures of social vulnerability uh, so in the darkest blue, you're finding the areas of highest concern. And in the final map, we can see in red the areas where a greater proportion of the population lacks health insurance. So the thing is, once you understand your vulnerabilities, you're going to want to determine your overall capacity to respond. And that's what I'm going to talk about in step four. That can take many forms, but here's some ideas to just get you started. You'll want to map your critical infrastructure. Where are all of the hospitals of various different types? What is the bed capacity in those hospitals? How many licensed beds are there? 
How many are staffed? What is the ICU bed capacity? I mean, you're reading about these things in the news every day. You might ask similar questions about developing capacity for testing centers in your jurisdictions. Where should those go? What kinds of volume and accessibility needs should be met as we consider that siting? Uh, and don't forget about the human capital that we rely on, like healthcare workers of different types and different specialties. I think we also need to consider supplies and where they should be positioned. Uh, this includes what we call point of distribution or, or POD pods, uh, those locations, as well as general supply chain kinds of needs. We have to be sure that we can see what we have and where we have it so that we can spot shortages and start to make needed adjustments in resource allocation. So to show you an example, we created this infographic report at the county level that is really meant to estimate morbidity and mortality. So in this case, we're looking at Los Angeles County, California, and across the top, we show information related to the population, the number of households, median income, a diversity index, that kind of stuff. The next section is based on the CDC's current predictions for infection rates, hospitalization rates, intensive care unit needs, and fatality rates, each of those by age cohort. So the CDC had provided these high and low range estimates, and we just carry through the math here for the local population characteristics. So this kind of information, while it's a, a snapshot in time can offer insight into the jurisdiction's capacity needs. I have another way to look at this. In this example, we're seeing Jefferson County, Tennessee and their hospital bed capacity information. Now this data, by the way, came from Definitive Healthcare, who generously agreed to share their data assets freely during the pandemic. So you can see the county boundary and do you see the hospital at all? I think I can help you. It's a purple dot kind of in this northwest part of the county. So what you can see when you click the pop up is that this hospital has 58 staffed beds. That's not really a lot. So if Jefferson County starts to see a lot of cases, they're going to want to look at their neighbors and see if they have neighbors that can handle the overflow. So here the University of Tennessee Medical Center has 609 beds in their system. Uh, looks much better. Now we can also do things like look at the healthcare providers in Jefferson County and get a view of their locations by provider type. We can also learn which providers are close to our exact location. So if I mark a location of my residence, say I lived in Hodges, Tennessee, then I could see within five miles of me, there are two family physicians. And the fifth basic step that I wanted to communicate is probably one you know very well, uh, and that is communicating with maps. And we all know people tend to love maps, which is useful for engaging their interest. Um, but there's another thing that's unique to maps, and that is the volume of information that can be uh, conveyed and interpreted quite quickly. And we want to help jurisdictions communicate with maps by deploying their own COVID-19 response hub, like the one that I shared with you a few minutes ago in the beginning. And you can also look uh, to use tools like story maps and dashboards and web maps, like some of the examples that I just showed you, uh, to communicate the information across your stakeholders, your communities, and the public. Now, lots of you are already doing this. Uh, Valley County, Idaho and Leon County, Florida are both thinking about businesses and how they're impacted and even how they've adjusted their business models to be more resilient in this difficult time. And there are a lot of jurisdictions providing public information about school closings and event cancellations. And at some point, uh, if, as you think about it, these may be showing exactly the opposite information as we move toward recovery like which schools are reopened and which events have been rescheduled. In Boone County, Missouri, they've used these county impact planning reports that we created to gain insight into the community characteristics that's going to help with their planning and response activities. Now, the state of Alabama has implemented a testing site locator so that people can find their nearest testing center. 
And early on in this crisis, the state of Oklahoma shared nationwide airport impacts to bring awareness to travelers across the country. Now, at this point, I want to dive into some specific tools that we're providing to help you overcome some technical challenges that you could be facing, uh, given the timeline and the resources needed to take action. Uh, as an example, a lot of communities don't have the IT infrastructure or at least the time of the IT staff to support digital resources for thousands of users, especially if an application goes viral, which it likely will in this uh, particular circumstance. I'm also guessing that given the speed of COVID-19, there's insufficient time for development or, and sometimes even for configuring tools to communicate with your stakeholders and the community about what's going on. And most of the data related to COVID-19 response is at the national or global scale, and it might be inaccurate or non-existent for uh, certain localities. And to complicate matters further, data is changing very rapidly as this situation progresses. Um, I'm guessing everybody's looking at uh, their dashboards on a daily or near daily basis. So to help overcome all of these challenges, we've developed two turnkey solutions that will enable you to respond for your community and for your own business or uh, organizational environment. So I wanna start with the coronavirus response solution, and it really is meant to uh, track, report, and monitor coronavirus cases in the community to track the changing status of public gathering places like schools and government facilities that may have closed. It's meant to inventory places where people can get testing and treatment, um, if uh, like the, where the testing sites are, uh, the hospitals and the clinics. It's meant to keep people informed so that they can be aware of testing and treatment facilities of uh, all of those closures of schools and gathering places and give them information about how they can particularly stay healthy and safe. Uh, so I also want to mention that this is really meant for several different kinds of users. Uh, it could be your internal staff that uh, have a need to know. It supports members of the public who need reliable and authoritative information, and certainly they're more likely to trust the more local that information can come from. And finally, the solution supports incident uh, commanders and government leaders that need a high level view of the impact to the community to figure out what actions they should be taking next. So misinformation, of course, can be counterproductive or even dangerous during a pandemic. So the solution includes apps for managing and updating authoritative data. So with these apps, public health staff and other kinds of data stakeholders like school boards or government employees, uh, they can easily update information about new cases, the status of those testing sites, and, and like I said, the school closures and government offices, whatever it is that is their responsibility for updating. And it gives you a really easy way to collect this data for your community, and you can become a source for, again, the most authoritative information reducing reliance on those national level data resources and improving accuracy. Now, after that, you can share the data you've collected with the community through public facing apps that work on desktops and mobile devices. And with these apps, citizens can select any point on the map, and I think you all know this, and then they can view all of that information, like the closure status, uh, where the gathering places are that they should be avoiding um, facilities that may be available to them within a certain radius, like two miles from their house, for example. They can also see uh, things like new operating hours, um, because those could be frequently changing for different kinds of businesses. And so I think this really can help citizens prepare uh, and plan their days, um, understanding what closures may be happening in their communities. Now, the solution also includes apps that let the public look up the location and status of testing sites and medical facilities. Again, all of these things are very location-based, and you can connect people with the right resources. 
Now, all of these resources can be used for communication and decision making, um, but I would say that our critical communication tool is this community impact dashboard for this particular solution. It really combines all of the information that is managed by the solution in a single common operating picture. So you can use this for those internal briefings or for the incident commanders. Uh, it's great for governors and mayors and other executives. Um, or it can be a primary communication tool for transparency if uh, that's the way your organization feels about it. It's a really powerful way to understand how coronavirus is impacting uh, the local area. So you can start to improve communications and guide that decision making. Now, from the beginning, with the Johns Hopkins University dashboard that came out and the WHO dashboard, I have no doubt that you've seen it. Uh, we get over a thousand requests per minute for those dashboards um, on our, our system. It's really clear people are hungry for this information and they really want it in a dynamic way. Now I'm going to spend the briefest amount of time on our second solution, which is the Coronavirus Business Continuity Solution. It's a collection also of maps and apps to maintain business operations in this case and share authoritative information with customers and stakeholders uh, if you wish. The hub template um, allows you to rapidly build a website that provides this authoritative information to whomever you, you want to share it with. Um, but basically, it helps you to keep track of uh, your employees, how they're doing, particularly if they're working virtually or if they're still needed to work in the field, like in the case of utilities. It helps you to keep track of your facilities and manage that. And then, uh, again, that external communication piece. Now, to make all of this information usable and accessible to everyone that needs it, we recognize that people need a single place where they can go to find it um, that's relevant to their community or business. And so we created a template so you can set up your own coronavirus response hub and provide that destination just like we did uh, with, with our hub resource. So everybody can have their own local one-stop shop. Um, including all of the maps and apps I just described can be put on, on your hub. It's available as a website template for ArcGIS um, in our cloud-based management system uh, platform. And it was designed to be really easy to configure so that it works with everything. Um, in fact, it only takes a few keystrokes to get it set up. So what else do you actually get with uh, any of these solutions? Um, you get all of the coronavirus solution maps and apps that I described, plus the response template for ArcGIS Hub. And we've designed all of the components to be configurable out of the box, so you don't have to spend a lot of time setting up the apps or writing any custom code. If you're not already using ArcGIS, you also get the ArcGIS online subscription needed to power the solution. Also ArcGIS Insights and Hub Basic, all of this at no cost. Esri uh, offers implementation and enablement consulting to help you set up your data, configure the solutions, educate your team. Um, and we provide technical support to help you maintain the solution once you have deployed it. Notably, I will say the business continuity solution has uh, an additional complexity to it. Um, everything else is quite easy, but that one does require um, some services to implement. If you want to learn more, of course, you can ask any one of us or check the website. So if you're interested in using the coronavirus response solution for your community, let us know. We'd be happy to help you get started. Uh, we really want you to be successful, so we've compiled some resources that will help guide you. So the first bullet point here is a detailed blog that outlines how to deploy the ArcGIS hub template for coronavirus and it'll take you step by step through the whole process. Like I said, just a few clicks. Um, if you need some inspiration, we've curated a collection of hub sites that were created by other organizations around the world, including the ones we just showed you. That's the second bullet. These are great models uh, that can um, show you how you can share information, data, and tools uh, in really effective ways. Next, we have created a solution template web page for coronavirus response. And on that page, you're gonna find instructions on how to deploy the solution, 
Um, and if you want a little more coaching, there is a recorded webinar um, that shows someone actually deploying the solution live and discussing the steps as they go. And finally, we have uh, collected some useful resources to support your coronavirus response activities. As I mentioned before, ESRI's COVID-19 Resources Hub is updated daily with all of the latest user examples and best practices that we're aware of. And clicking on the Resources tab of the Hub where I showed you before is going to showcase the latest uh, blogs and training and guidance from ESRI on how you can respond with GIS technology. And uh, I think that's probably about it. You could spend your whole life looking for uh, wonderful things on the Hub because it's all there. Um, but let me turn it over to Richard to talk about policy maps and what else you can do. Thank you, Esty. Always good and informative. Um, I want to introduce this audience. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that this URIS audience, that the Living Atlas is, a, is an old and well-worn uh, friend. Uh, the Living Atlas, for those who are new uh, to, to ESRI and, and to our resources, the Living Atlas is literally hundreds of data sets collected in a central repository. These are curated data sets. They're contributed by both ESRI and our user base, people like you, uh, to showcase the best data out and available. Uh, so I encourage you to visit the Living Atlas site uh, to find resources and data. Many of the, of the data layers that SD uh, pointed out that are also collected uh, and, and distributed through the, hub, our, the ESRI hub sites uh, are, are present here on a permanent basis. Uh, they they uh, represent solutions that are uh, uh, wide and far. Uh, you can see that there are there are many, many different categories that we segment this data into, and it's there with metadata. So you get to find out, not only be able to test the data, view the data, but bring it into active desktop environments, use it as a URL in, a, in an application that you, correct, that you create. But most importantly, it has metadata. It has descriptions and contacts on who to visit and what to see. Uh, with that, I want to introduce you to our policy map area. It's part of the Living Atlas, so it's just a repurpose of those Living Atlas data sets that have, um, that have action with them. A definition of a, of a good policy map is something that uh, allows or provides an opportunity to intervene. And uh, next slide. And by introducing you to these sites, I want to show you some very good uh, collection of, of data that is both uh, insightful but actionable. The first site, the page currently up, is our is our introduction slide, and we do have a a, uh, a link right to data related to the the uh, the uh, the pandemic in a collection. Uh, next slide. By selecting on the area, you're instantly looking at nine data layers that we have collected for you on this topic. You can see on the left side that we also have many other topics and, and categories that we group our data into. So instantly it's showing you, in this case, daytime population, okay? Uh, both from a cartographic point of view, but from the data point of view as well. You can see on the right side where this, where we can share this collection. And it gives you a link into the data that you can share, either through email or social media. That allows you to share this data in a viewing format to your, to your decision makers, to your policy makers saying, hey, here's data that could help and allows them to, to investigate the data on their own. Next slide. You can see that you can go in, view the data, remove the data from collection. It's interactive, but most importantly, uh, next slide. It allows you, it, it provides you that, uh, that communication portal where you can start to send this data out and about to your decision makers to share, to validate and curate the data as this, is this the data we want to use? So it's a great way to start uh, collecting, finding, sharing uh, the data that might be important to your policy decisions, especially in policy decisions connected to our topic here today. The, the uh, the, the uh, pandemic. 
And uh, the final slide I, I will close on. Uh, again, uh, as SD mentioned, we have a link to our coronavirus uh, resources. Uh, all of the content mentioned here today, pointed out in, in SD's slides, is available at this site. I encourage you to go visit, find the data that's meaningful to your discussions in your local environments. Uh, start to investigate, start to share it, start to see if it's usable at your local levels, and start communicating and making up information. Uh, if you know me, you know that I often challenge uh, GIS users to make a map. Often I'm asked, oh, how do I talk to my elected officials? How do I talk to the decision makers in my, in my community? First and foremost, make them a map. There's no better way to, to get understanding, to start understanding of a process, especially to people who are not familiar with GIS and, and the wealth of analysis that it provides. There's no better way to start the discussion than making them a map. And with that, uh, I will turn it over back to Brett to start answering any questions, taking questions from the audience and, uh, and close out the uh, webinar. That's perfect. Okay, here's another question. What are some good questions to ask with regards to maps? Should it be time trends? Should it be cases per capita? Uh, I think it depends on the end user. I, SD had some really good examples of the global uh, national county level information. We have another webinar coming up on April 8th, which we'll talk about this at the, at the neighborhood level. So it depends on which organization uh, you're with and, and what the actual needs are at that point. Here's another one. Are there open sources, resources available for making interactive maps? Um, I pasted in the window the disaster relief program request for assistance. If you don't have Esri technology, you can, re you can apply and receive it there. I will make note that most of these apps are open source. Uh, the code is freely available to anyone to manipulate it and change the way uh, that these maps uh, act and work. And, and Brent, you might also consider the data on the Living Atlas and, and within the policy map as open source. It is there, it's published, it's curated. Uh, Absolutely. And it's, there, and it's there for people to use. Yeah. Now, the here's another one. Um, is, what is the simple way to develop a dashboard easily? Well, the dashboard that you saw from Johns Hopkins and the dashboard from WHO, um, literally takes minutes to put together because they're driven by um, web services. So connecting to the services and configuring how you want the dashboard to look and you're up and running. Uh, that's why there's so many dashboards out there and that's how they, uh, they've they moved out there so quickly. Okay, here's one from a, uh, from a small uh, local government in North Carolina. They don't have much data. Um, my answers are not pasting into the answer window. Um, so I pasted the website where you can access uh, county level infographics that uh, that SD showed. So hopefully that, that gets through to you. Um, SD, here's a question for you. Does the healthcare facility database include, include long-term care facilities uh, like nursing homes? So it, uh... I don't believe it includes nursing homes. It includes uh, short-term acute care and long-term acute care. So I would say that may be certain types of nursing homes, but I don't think it's all nursing homes. Um, I will say that depending on where you are, you can get even more detailed uh, licensing information, which would tell you the, the type of facility from some of your state boards, like in California, it's the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, and you can literally download all of their hospital uh, data to understand those different facility types and locations. Okay, here's another one. Um, I think this is another one good for you, SD. Uh, can you suggest ways to get reluctant public health departments to buy into sharing our county's data? <laughs> um, I, know, I know I know the cynical answer to that. Well, no, but it's uh, it goes back to what I was saying before about HIPAA and I've you know I've worked in state government before and I totally understand that there is um, absolute concern over protecting privacy. And uh, so that's one of the barriers. 
sharing. And, you know, there are other probable political barriers to sharing as well. But I think first and foremost, we have to get over that protected health information part. And um, I do have a, a webinar that I did. So if you invest an hour's worth of, of time and listen to it, it is on our, our ESRI website. Um, if you look up the health and human services industry, we have a whole section of webinars. It's called Navigating HIPAA in a Geospatial World. And what you have to do, I think, first is convince public health departments that they can safely share the data. So that's barrier number one. After that, um, in, in my experience and my opinion as well, uh, there's got to be a clear why. You know, what is the value proposition? What is the reason for sharing that is going to improve health? And then you also have to kind of have prepared responses to the negatives, right? What, what are the protections that you are going to give to ensure that you don't embarrass the department or the administration and all of that stuff, which really means to me that you provide really good metadata, you understand and share with anybody who sees the data what the potential limitations are and, and what question is trying to answer. So it's not the easiest answer, but you can uh, convince people when you've got the facts and the data to support you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin, this is a good one. Uh, we talked about, we actually had this detailed conversation um, prior to the webinar. Uh, this guy works for a company that has a lot of field engineers that still work actively outside. I'm thinking to build a place that could be used to report where they were for the day and probably where they went and how they feel. Does this sound suitable for the template? So yeah, you want so to describe uh, the process yeah, you were going to ask? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Um, I was working with a utility company out west that is looking at using the reporting tool that comes with our solution to record contacts that they have with customers. So if you have a customer service person that has to go out in the field or you have a, a crew that's going out to replace a transformer and somebody comes out to see what they're doing and then you have contact with that person, they can record that location where that was to do a trace back if that person were to get sick. So you could, you could get creative with our tools and expand them for your custom use. And that's just one of the one of the thoughts that we were brainstorming on yesterday with the utility company. That's perfect. Um, I just posted in the window um, our meetup, and at these meetups, I think it went in there. At these meetups, um, we'll be having one on April 10th, and we'll have some more of these where we dig into uh, the hands on how we do this, and Kevin will be uh, digging deep into the technology on that. Um, does the Living Atlas cover the world? Uh, yes, it's it's a global data set. Um, let's see. So that was a pretty easy one. You might okay, want to as, also mention though that we have the uh, the Africa Geo Portal as a special data set for Africa. It's like Living Atlas for Africa. Perfect. Thank you. Um, here's another one for you, SD. Uh, one of the big challenges have been getting a sense of hospital beds, acute care beds, etc. Also, how many people are currently hospitalized, let's say within San Diego County or Los Angeles County, when there is, when one is not working for a healthcare organization? Do experts here have any thoughts on addressing this, this issue with speed? Ah, yes, lots of thoughts there and, uh, and probably equal to what it sounds like you're expressing some frustrations. Um, we've been trying to facilitate some of that uh, data capture, or at least ways, I mean, it, it's even more serious than that. It's not only the data capture, but being able to um, uh, share from the level of a hospital to a county or to a state so that everybody's really well informed and can assist in the planning stages. Um, so I'm hearing all sorts of different things, uh, but I can say from my point of view, people are not sharing broadly. Um, we're looking at other ways to help hospitals share in their own language. And what I mean by that is uh, HL7. If you're familiar, it's uh, called Hospital Level 7, and it's a uh, data transmission language. 
and uh, I think facilitating that will help. We're working on those aspects. But yes, you're you're really pointing out a challenge and a frustration. Uh, we're trying to get people to do it. You see the uh, the email from or the mail from Mike Pence to hospitals about sharing that information with the federal government. Here's another one. Um, can we predict where the virus is going to go? Um, I'm going to I'm going to give my observation, Esty, and then I'd like you to comment on that. It seems to me where pe where there are areas where uh, the population is not hunkered down, sheltered in space, sheltered in place, and taking very proactive measures, uh, the virus will show up there and will be a problem. That that's that's my my observation. Would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, I I don't think that's wrong, but I what I would say is that in some ways we can make proxy predictions, but we can't predict it like we would predict a normal flu outbreak, for example, um, because there are models that are available to make these kinds of predictions and anticipations. Um, but we don't know all the parameters yet for COVID-19. It's a novel coronavirus after all, and people are still studying it. So what that means is that we have to come up with different ways of making predictions. And we're understanding those vulnerabilities, which is why it's such an important step in the process I outlined, um, as well as understanding if our interventions are having an impact like that data that I showed you on social distancing and if it's working. If people aren't behaving, it'll definitely spread more. It'll be a worse pandemic than it is already. But we can't predict the exact spread with a whole lot of certainty outside of those behaviors. That's perfect. Um, COVID-19 surveillance dashboard is very informative. Can it be developed freely uh, for localities? Uh, yes. If you don't have the software, I pasted in the request assistance. Um, in the window, uh, in the chat window, uh, but it all you need to do is connect it to the data services. We have these running at small municipalities, large municipalities, state level, provincial level, national levels, uh, and we have it. We have a story map of actually all the one for the Americas, which is quite quite interesting. Um, doesn't Definitive have nursing home data? Do you, do you know the answer to that, Esty? Um, well, I was saying I, I just wasn't uh, sure. Um, Definitive actually has quite a lot of data, and we only asked them to provide the hospital uh, and health system data. So they have, you know, some primary care information and other data sets. Uh, we're working with them now to try and get specific ventilator information because we know that's uh, needed across the country. But uh, I would have to say that I couldn't I couldn't answer that with any responsible answer. Okay, here's another one. Um, I'd like to connect with GIS Core and start helping. I pasted the GIS Core link in the window. Uh, Kevin Mickey, if you're still listening, uh, that might be a great webinar for you, Arissa, to put on on how to connect up with the GIS Core and uh, uh, and help out. We will post a link of this recording. Uh, it probably it, we can post it on the ERISA Cor Coronavirus web uh, resource page. I think that's a good place to post it. Um, and that was from Wendy. Of course, we can post that on there, Wendy. Um, and that's our last question. If no, if if you know, we'll go once, twice, tries here. Oh, we got one more. Can we analyze the COVID information using remote sensing? techniques, bands, combinations, etc. The only thing I know that we've done with that is is analyzing population density uh, with satellite imagery. We, we don't know of anything regarding the COVID information with remote sensing techniques. Uh, do you have anything, Esty? Uh, I don't. It's a great question. And uh, as a physician, I never did that much with remote sensing. So it's it's a little bit of a knowledge gap for me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would love if somebody had ideas, maybe they could post those in the chat too. Okay, and I'm going to copy Wendy's post. 
on how to become a GIS core volunteer. I posted that in the chat window and we'll let that sit for a moment for those who want to connect to that. Um, and with that, I would like to thank um, Kevin, SD of course, and Richard for your help on this. The uh, very timely uh, webinar, uh, very good information. And please stay tuned uh, to ERISA for additional information and the ERISA COVID information website. And with that, I'll sign off and thank everyone for their time. Thank you.